Hello, everyone. I see the uh, waiting room filling in here. We'll give it a couple seconds as we get going. Um, happy Pride. Thank you for joining us today. We have such an awesome panel lined up um, for uh, our Pride, in recognition of Pride, to celebrate Pride, talking to LGBTQ creators across film, TV, theater, digital media, really diving into their careers and individual projects, um, as well as just the industry at large, their experience, their advice to other actors and creators out there who are tuning in today. Um, so yes, thank you for joining us. I will give a, as quick as I can. We have seven awesome panelists here, so give a quick intro for each. Um, we have writer, director, and producer Daniel Barnes, who co-created Generation on HBO Max with his daughter Zelda Barnes. The series follows a diverse group of high school students' exploration of modern sexuality, and it returns for the second half of season one this Thursday, June 17th. It's been praised for its unflinching and empathetic look at Gen Z. Um, I just had the chance to binge the whole thing this long weekend, and uh, really, really stellar performances, writing, direction, just across the board. Um, Next up, we have Stephen Canals. He's the creator and co-showrunner of FX's Emmy-winning and boundary-pushing Pose, which celebrated its third and final season earlier this month. He's a graduate of UCLA's MFA screenwriting program, and he's previously worked with Dustin Lance Black's Hungry Jackal Productions and on Freeform's Dead of Summer. Adam Goldman is the creator and producer behind Audible's new original scripted podcast, Hot White Heist, directed by Alan Cumming, who also co-produces. The series stars a who's who of LGBTQ performers led by Saturday Night Live's Bowen Yang. Previously, Goldman is best known for his hit digital series, The Outs and Whatever This Is. Actor, writer, and social justice advocate, Brandon Kyle Goodman is a writer and voice actor on Big Mouth and can now be seen starring in The Latrell Show, a dark comedy exploring the mental aerobics of being black and queer in America. It's been available all month to stream by the IAMA Theater in Los Angeles, and that's running through June 27th. Um, be sure to check it out, and we'll be talking about it today. Um, acclaimed writer, producer, and director, Leslie Headland is previously best known for television projects like Russian Doll and films like Bachelorette, and now she's making history as the first ever queer showrunner in the Star Wars canon. Plus, The Accolade is itself the first ever female-centric Star Wars property, so we've got plenty to discuss there. And finally, longtime actor, recording artist, and trans rights advocate Trace the Set, previously seen on Transparent and in Hustlers, made her producerial debut this year with Topics docuseries Trans in Trumpland, which deep dives into how the Trump administration negatively impacted the lives of transgender Americans. Um, so as I promised, we have quite the lineup here. It's such a treat to have everyone in the same virtual room. So thank you everyone for joining us and happy Pride to you all. Um, just to get things started here, um, Brandon, I, I'd like to start with you actually, because your work first came to my attention, particularly in this last year, both across um, your theater work with things like the Trial Show and Big Mouth, but also your social justice work on social media platforms, partnering with actors like Tom Ellis to really take this opportunity of the of isolation, otherwise mm -hmm. isolation, and used it to spread the messaging of equality across the board. Um, that's definitely echoed in a project like the Latrell Show. I'm curious if advoc advocacy has always been married to your work as an artist and when that marriage kind of happened for you as a creator. Yeah, my, um, my mother used to say, you have to have a mission statement for your life. Like corporations have mission statements and you should as well for your life. And so for me, it was representation. I've always been interested in seeing myself and seeing people like me and seeing black stories and queer stories. It, there just wasn't enough of that growing up. So everything that I did as a writer and an actor was to put those stories out there, whether it's my own or sharing others. So I think that now people, more people will see me and I'm a little more visible, but even before when I was just in little black box theaters in downtown New York, that was the mission was like, how do I tell my story? How do I share black queer stories? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I, I think that that sentiment can be echoed through all our panelists today in terms of the importance of telling their own stories, making things personal and thereby making them universal. Um, I, I'll go to Trace for a moment. I, I've long admired your work, not just as an actor, but also in your efforts to hold power to account, the powerful to account, that's obviously seen in a docu-series like Trans and Trump Land. Um, tell us a bit how you first got involved with this project and why it was a mission that you wanted to put your power behind. 
Sure. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't, I'm not big on um, upholding like tradition and like the powers that be. So I'm, I'm always down to kind of buck authority, uh, even if it gets me in trouble sometimes. But um, with Trans and Trump land, I think I was just looking for something in the doc space that was gonna um, shed light on what trans folks were going through throughout the country. And I, I, I wanted to get into the doc space for a long time. And when Tony and Jamie came along, um, they had most of their footage already. And it was basically just me kind of steering them in for the landing, helping them edit, giving them rounds of notes, trying to get it um, to a well-rounded place and, and hooking them up with, with a home. And that's what we did. And it's a really beautiful um, four episode series about people in parts of the country where it's even harder to be trans. I mean, we live in a time now when it's like probably easier than it's ever been to be trans, but it's still very, very hard, especially in certain parts of the country. Um, but as a girl who transitioned in the 90s, it's like, okay, we've been here before. Uh, and, but it's important to talk about the legislation is to talk about um, the battles that people go through in parts of the country that are not on opposite coasts that, you know, it's kind of uh, a little more bearable. So yeah, that's, that's how I got involved with it. They just came with most of their baby intact already. And, and I was able to just help them do what they do. That's, that speaks to trans creators and letting us kind of have the wheel. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I love that I, I was able to to include you on this because you are a first time producer, and to be able to to attach your experience and kind of your your mission as a artist to a project like this, it, it's just such a uh, marrying of the minds. It, it's such a great project, Trans and Trump Land. For those who haven't seen it, it's streaming on Topic. Um, to jump off of that, Stephen, um, your series Pose, of course, was such a landmark event in entertainment in general. Um, I know that you had quite the experience early on when you were shopping your pilot in terms of being rejected. Um, you, you, can, you can say for sure how many times, how many meetings you had before you finally got that yes from Ryan Murphy. Um, but to, yeah, tell us a bit about the early stages of this project and the hardship and rejection that you had to push through to ultimately make these important stories hit the small screen. Well, I want to like to echo what Brandon was saying earlier. I, you know, my commitment is always to telling the stories of LGBT, Black, and Latinx people because we just have never occupied space on television. Um, I mean, to be quite frank, LGBTQ people, regardless of race and ethnicity, don't occupy space on television, and so it was important to create a narrative that that centered us and specifically a narrative that wasn't rooted in our trauma. So, you know, going around and, and pitching the show was tough. It was I, over the course of two and a half years, I had 166 meetings in this industry before I finally met um, my executive producer, Sherry Marsh, who introduced me to Ryan. Um, and, you know, and, and even then, you know, it, it was still, there was a lot of labor that went into, um, crafting the narrative and, and putting it out in the world. And, you know, I'm proud of it. I think that, you know, we obviously, we leaned as much into the joy of the story um, as possible, but ultimately, um, you know, it's still a lot of work. It's, it's, it's tiring and it's taxing, but important work. It's work that I think is really necessary. And I think that, you know, like to, to Trace's point earlier around the docu-series, I think, you know, there's that, there's that work that we all have to do as LGBT plus people when it comes to having our hands at the wheel to tell our own story. And so, you know, I think similar to Trace's experience with her docu-series, like I was a first time producer also, like I'd never produced television prior to meeting Ryan. And so, um, you know, there's also, there's this added layer of being handed the wheel um, and then feeling like, okay, I just need to make sure that I keep my hands here and that I keep moving straight because if at any point this veers off, you know, there's the possibility then that this is going to impact 
everybody else within the community. Because I think one of the things that we often don't talk about is that we're not just representing ourselves. Like it's, we're not in this like insular vacuum that in reality, like we all are representing everybody in the community. Um, so that was, a, it was a lot of work, but I'm really proud of it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and when it comes to, I'd like to, I do have specific questions for all the creators here, but just to kind of bounce off of that, I'd love to open the floor to anyone who wants to take the mic, um, just in terms of that idea of creating work that is representative of a larger whole. Um, has that been an intimidating prospect? Has that come with a certain weight that echoes what Stephen is talking about? I mean, with something like Generation, for instance, you are representing queer Gen Z. Um, so so I'm, I'm just curious if the, the umbrella is kind of a pressure to get it all in there, if you know what I mean. Yeah, definitely. I, I definitely think it is daunting trying to figure out how to how to make everyone feel seen, which is obviously a very difficult job. Um, but it is it is really important. I don't think um, the impact of feeling seen and feeling represented on screen can be underestimated. I think it is so incredibly necessary for queer youth to see themselves not just accepted, but like genuinely celebrated on TV. And I think that that was really our probably biggest goal with Generation was to craft a story about queer joy and queer celebration and queer love and not just queer torture and the difficulties of being LGBTQ. Um, so yeah, that was definitely really important to us. That was something we had a lot of conversations about, about how to like um, include a lot of positive representation into our project. Yeah, I also just want to jump in. First of all, I'm so honored to be on this panel. Like I admire these like people's work so much. I love your shows and your projects and your work. Um, and I'm like rapidly crafting a mission statement for my life, even as we speak. <laughs> um, but uh, I think one thing that I feel that we're very lucky to be able to do um, in Generation and many of us on this um, panel are to be able to um, put LGBTQ characters front and center. And um, that's a real blessing and something that I feel has um, really changed in the world. Um, because there have obviously been LGBTQ characters, but in the sidelines. And I think what mm -hmm. we're able to do is, um, and very luckily, is to be able to tell, um, put these characters front and center, make them the sort of the, the central characters and to explore storylines that are about their sexuality and their gender identification, but also just who they are as people. Um, and it's a real gift to be able to do that. I think there's, you know, this question of how do you represent everybody is is really interesting and it's kind of a trap, right? I mean, because you can't, because it's impossible. And I think that we can get sort of caught up in that trap. This is how I felt. And really the best that we can do is take the platform that we have and tell the best story possible that some people will communicate with that can feel universal. And then the, the better we do, the more opportunities we as a community will have to keep doing that. And that's a pressure that we queer creators should not have to deal with that pressure, but we do, and here we are. And luckily sometimes it provides a really enthusiastic audience who connects with the work, but that tension of trying to represent people, trying to be true to yourself, trying to tell the best story possible is where I think a lot of really good work lives, but it's, it does require an extra amount of thought and care, I think. How yeah. do you guys yeah, navigate definitely. that? How do you? How does everyone navigate that that balance of wanting to represent the community because we're not out there, but also wanting to be an artist and do what you want to do and, and like walking that line? How do y'all how do y'all do it? Great question. <laughs> I mean, I, for me, it's like the only thing you have that's unique is your voice, right? All, all you can do, even if you're trying not to, is, is deliver what you can deliver, right? So I think it's a, for me, for my like arc, it's just been about getting out of my own way and saying, this is the story that I want to tell. This is the story that's true to me and not being embarrassed of that or ashamed of that or letting that get watered down and finding the people who it connects with because it will connect, even if it feels like it won't connect. It's just mm -hmm. about finding the right, the right audience. So anytime that I've tried to push myself beyond just what feels true to me, it, it doesn't feel good. I don't like that feeling. So I tr I've learned to just stick with what, what I love. I don't know what other people feel about that. I think it also just requires 
learning how to be a great listener. I mean, this was like the big thing about collaborating with my daughter um, on a project because I could bring years of storytelling experience, but I couldn't bring the sort of the authentic experience of what it is to be a queer teenager right now in a show that was about queer teenager. And I think just in thinking about your question, Brandon, I feel like what I'm always trying to do is to figure out how to be um, a better listener um, mm -hmm. so that as we're trying to figure out, navigate kind of um, representation to, to sort of put aside the idea that we might have all the answers to that and to kind of listen to sort of all the people around. And we um, were blessed with an extraordinary cast and writers um, to help, uh, help us be aware of our blind spots um, and uh, better represent. Yeah. I'm I was going to say the same thing that yeah. that that having a bunch of different voices has helped me because I get very stressed out. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I really like, uh, especially when I was building my room for the acolyte. I, you know, I really wanted to pick people that, um, you know, queer voices, but also people that had completely different experiences um, than I than I have had in my life. You know, like uh, meaning, you know, I had a very weird journey as a lesbian and didn't didn't come out until I was in my mid 30s so you know I embraced heteronormativity and a lot of stuff for, for a very long time into that kind of institutional straightness and you know it was going to be queer and told for a straight audience like you know I think my internet cut out but anyway I who are and who are going to challenge you hopefully you heard that <laughs> sorry no, we, we got it we got it the, the internet was a little spotty but that's just the nature of these things right no problem um i, I am curious kind of lo looking to adam and leslie and brandon um you also in addition to film tv you're working across different mediums adam you, you have really embraced kind of digital DIY spaces with web series and now working, partnering with Audible, working on podcasts. Leslie, Brandon, you have your roots in the theater. Um, does the negotiation of exploring these themes differ when you're reaching a more mainstream audience? Some, something that is ostensibly on HBO or FX, so, so something that is on film, TV, getting out there in a different avenue than like a contained theater environment. What's your experience with that? I think there's more pushback. I think when you're in theater, it's like, do whatever the fuck you want, right? You're like, you know, 10 people will see it, 100 people will see it, just do what you want. Whereas when you start to like add a lot more money behind it, when you have networks, then I think there's more pushback and there's more, well, how do I defend my vision? Um, which I think for me, theater kind of builds that because, you know, you, you are still working with the team and trying to bring your very specific vision in your head to life. So it's similar with TV, but I think then you just have to know how to talk network, you know, talk that like, you know, money language so that they go, oh, okay. Or you make them think it's <laughs> your idea. It's like, yeah, it's your idea, exec person. So let's do it. You know, it's just a different finesse, but I think it's, it's more pushback is what I feel is the difference because we're doing stuff. I mean, this panel is fucking insane. I'm a fan of all of you and you're all doing things that just haven't been done. And so when you're doing something that hasn't been done and things that haven't been seen, you know, the, the straight white execs get very scared and, and you're up against that. It's like, trust me, trust me, trust me. There's an audience, this story matters, this is necessary. And how do you like say it in a way that they go, okay, run, you know? And Adam, does that, um, to, to use Brandon's words, the pushback, is, is that at all inform your reasoning for embracing something like a web series for the outs? I mean, that was back in 2012. And to, to see a, a digital series like that, get the traction that it did, get the acclaim, get the press, um, it really was modern and of its time in that sense. And then you also are working in the digital space with Audible now. Um, so what do these avenues offer queer creators that um, you haven't experienced elsewhere. 
I mean, I think there's a few things, you know, my, my background is in the theater, I studied theater. And so I carry this sort of, hey kids, let's put on a show ethos into everything that I do. And that's the easiest thing to do when you're making a web series and you can't pay anyone. And it's just that, you know, um, and I think there's also this element of not having to negotiate with networks, with gatekeepers, that sort of thing. Audible is obviously, it's not like let's put on a show anymore. They're, they're audible, you know, um, but they give us a ton of freedom. And I think, you know, philosophically, it's just like make the thing, whatever you have to do to make the thing, whether that's making it as a web series, making it as a podcast in your basement, just to get it out there. And then you can kind of use that as a proof of concept um, to, to see, to show people that there's an audience, to show people that it can be done. Um, but I don't know. I mean, Hot White High started out as a feature pitch and it just became this thing of, well, let's see if we can make it work as a podcast. Now, if it was the same kind of concept, if it was a sperm bank heist about straight white men, I don't know, maybe that would be like more appealing. You know, this is a very femme forward, very queer woman forward project. So I don't know how that's, how that's, you know, how that, how that reflects. I can't really speculate about it, but I think it's true that when you, you look at emerging forms, podcast to whatever extent that's emerging web series in 2012 you know um even non-linear stuff non-linear television stuff is more open to diversity is more trying to bring in different audiences and less focused on having just a mainstream appeal so that's that can be a good place to look but that's not always necessarily true yeah yeah fair enough fair enough um L leslie I, I i'd like to jump to you for a moment um i read your uh contributed op-ed for variety earlier this month um and it, it was really great kind of talking about how you broke up with being straight around the same time that you were grappling with the success of bachelorette which i didn't know those two things kind of went hand in hand on the timeline um, since then, you obviously are an out and proud woman, but the stories that you're telling aren't necessarily explicitly queer in the same way that we might see elsewhere on this panel. So I'm curious as a storyteller, how you think you coming out, you being more authentically yourself has informed your skill set as a storyteller? Well, it's definitely changed the way that I speak about my work and about myself. Um, I don't, um, I think that because I was so unconscious for so long in my life, um, I kept telling these stories about women that, that were trapped, you know, by invisible forces, essentially, like whether that was like cultural forces or, or, um, literally in Russian doll, a time loop that she cannot escape, you know, like, um, it, it's always about women who are unclear of where, you know, where is the danger? It just feels like it's everywhere. And it feels like I can't, you know, be myself. What's interesting is that moving out in my own life personally, I've been able to more explicitly say, you know, this is, um, this is what I dealt with in coming out. This is what I dealt with with my family. This is what the process has been for me to go from someone that was desperately trying to be accepted um, and to assimilate myself into a culture that was uh, a part of our culture that I think is really damaging. And now to be free of that is a really interesting story to tell. And so I think that one, you know, everybody has this journey. Any queer person has this journey in, in a very different way. Mine, mine just happened to be this way you know it was almost like the call was coming from inside the house you know like it was like rosemary's baby or something it was like the problem's in here you know <laughs> like the problem is not outside you know like so what's interesting in working with such a large ip like star wars which is owned by an enormous corporation like disney is that a lot of times what you're dealing with is queer coded stories and not explicitly queer representation. Like I think that, for example, a movie like Frozen, if it had existed when I was a child, I think I would have had a completely different life. You know, like when I saw that film at 31, I was like sobbing uncontrollably in the movie theater. I just, I couldn't believe that I was like, you know, watching something that hit my inner child in such a deep way. And yet, you know, I understand, of course, there's a need for representation, but I also think that when, you know, when you're telling a story 
with the constraints of a particular IP or your, you know, or the corporate kind of overlord, a lot of things that you're doing are essentially going to be taken um, one way or the other. And so what I like to do is I like to kind of, you know, create um, characters to feel my feelings for me because it's very difficult for me to like actually be the open vulnerable person that I am in the world. It's very, very difficult. And what I've noticed is that, especially since I've come out, my characters have been a lot more outspoken uh, about how uh, the way that they've trapped themselves is not working. You know, like, I think it's really, really, um, it's really astonishing to watch them kind of, I don't know, this might be weird to talk about them that way, but it's like, I really do think of my characters as like other people that live in, the, they're like, they're like spirits that live in the world and they're just trying to get out and, and tell their story. And so I basically want to respect that, but they're also just a part of like my own psyche. And, um, and I think that what's interesting now is that I'm a lot more confident in, in, and I know where the call is coming from. Like I know what the monster is now and I know um, and I know how to articulate that better. Yeah, yeah, that's great. That's great. Um, I'm, I'm curious for the for the other creators here, whether, whether you're writing your own material, whether you're inhabiting a character as a performer, do you have uh, a comparable relationship with your characters? Are they kind of spirits roaming the world you see as real people? Um, I, I love that takeaway from Leslie. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I. I you spend so much time with these characters and living with them and the the reality, I mean, it's very writerly to say this, but you have to be in conversation with them so that you can help tell their story. Because the reality is like, it's not, it's not your story. You can find elements of their story that connect to you. You should always locate yourself within all of your characters. But the reality is like, they're their own separate beings and, and they're navigating the world and uh, who they are is going to inform all of the choices that they make within the narrative. And so you have to spend time getting to know all of them. Otherwise, it's just not going to feel grounded and real and authentic, you know. And I think, you know, to just take what Leslie was saying one step further, I think there's also just an added responsibility and pressure for all of us as LGBTQ plus people to really do that work. You know, I think that we're not given the same allowances in the industry in the way that others are. And, and because we so rarely see our stories represented, the reality is I think that we all probably come into all of the work that we're doing with that pressure already upon us, you know, because the reality is like, we don't get a ton of shots, you know? And so just as an example, uh, you know, a show like pose doesn't work and then it's like well then when's the next time you're going to see trans femmes on screen in reality you know what I mean it's like who knows um and so it does it there's a uh, this added responsibility for us yeah yeah absolutely um Z Zelda I'm interested in your perspective as well um because you're a first-time creator because you were co-creating with your father um what what has your experience been like in terms of quote, telling the stories that you want to tell, telling representative stories of LGBTQ plus um, communities. I mean, what did you experience any pushback? What was was it smooth sailing? Um, just for your first time out there? Is this echoing your experience at all? Or was it pretty, pretty unique to generation? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think that I think that being queer, there is a lot of like, justifying why this show has like so few prominent straight characters. I think that um, a lot of people have asked me like, so is everybody just gay in your show? And it's like, there's so many shows where everyone is just straight, so why not? And um, I do think there is a lot of, a lot of having to justify creating like a lot of queer representation in one show. Um, but that said, I will say that our partners at HBO Max have been really, really amazing collaborators um, and they really have supported us in our sort of journey for queer representation. Um, so it's it's been a positive experience, definitely. But I do think that 
in general in the world, um, queer stories are often kind of questioned. And I think that I have had to sort of navigate that. And also people have asked me like, are you even queer? And it's kind of, it's interesting having, feeling like I have to kind of justify why I as a queer person wanted to tell these stories. And yeah, it's just, I, I feel like I get a lot of questions about that that straight creators would never really get about straight shows, if that makes sense, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean that that feedback and that that energy that you receive is far too prevalent for uh, apparently for queer creators of all generations. Um, kind of bouncing off of that, I'd love to turn attention to a letter that was recently released by the LGBTQ plus writers committee of the WGA West. Um, so the letter was released last Friday, um, calling on Hollywood to hire more LGBTQ plus writers for film and television production promote better representation of these stories and challenge non-inclusive work environments. Um, first of all, did anyone here, was this on their radar when it came out, WGA West released a statement? Yes, okay, so it's not news to you guys, that's good. Um, just some of the facts and figures here, only 22 of the 118 films released by major studios in 2019 included queer characters, so that's less than 20%, 18.6%, and only nine of those featured, only nine of those features featured those characters for more than 10 minutes of screen time. Um, obviously those numbers get progressively more dire for by POC, for differently able communities um, ac across the board. Um, also polling, 150 members of the committee were polled and 46% reported that they have hidden their identity or felt compelled to do so in the writer's room. Um, so just given these facts and figures, obviously this is, a call to action and has been in in the after for a long time but to see it kind of written out like this in 2021 was pretty astounding to me um i'd love to hear everyone's thoughts just on the state of the the state of things at, at kind of what we're talking about today um but especially if it echoes any of your personal experiences um if we could just get that conversation going I, whoever wants to take the mic i mean my I feel like my therapist would be very proud of me because I'm gonna hold space for two things, which is one, like this is amazing, us on this panel being able to talk about that and that, you know, like 10 years ago, would this exist? Probably not. And two, there's a sadness in how far we have to go, right? There's a sadness in, you know, walking into a writer's room and being the only queer person or being the only black person and knowing that you have that pressure that Stephen was talking about and like feeling kind of lost in terms of, well, how do we push this needle and who do we need to talk? Like, why is this such an uphill battle? It just seems like such an easy solve, which is support, finance, back, champion, you know, give queer creators space to fail, to learn, to develop, to grow in the same way that a straight cis white man has. It's like, yeah, you have, you know how to do it. So why is it that we can't have that same support for us? So there's sadness in that, in being able to list the facts and know that there's truly no reason for it, like that we know how to do it. It's just that people want to hold on to their power. And in a certain sense, it means that we're not valued yet. Does that make sense? And there's a sadness in that, that our culture is valuable when it upholds straight people and white cis het communities. But if it's just us centering ourselves and our stories, the people in power still don't think that that's a value. And so that's sad. Um, I don't have the answer, but I do wanna hold space for how far we've come, but also there's so much further that we have yet to go. I think it also really changes the content. I mean, we were, you know, blessed in, in that we were able to have, um, well, with the exception of one person, an all queer room. And it changes the nature of everything because there's a, there's a shorthand, there's an understanding, there's a, here's why we don't want to focus on just coming out stories or here's where our things and there's like a, a that kind of community in there it it changed the nature of the stories that we wanted to tell and there was just a way that we could kind of relate and understand that that was really sort of um beautiful and i think to the point about that letter what is so hard 
is when you are that one person in the room who's then called upon to explain and justify and like and 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 kind of you know re-navigate people it's a tremendous burden so um the, the 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 end goal has to be these like communities where we can really you know these queer communities where we can come together and and produce um uh together i i think i've been really interested lately in this idea of context and like if your story or if your story takes place in the context of queer people in in a straight world or if you're the only queer writer in a straight room then you're in that context and I'm really interested. I think a lot of people here are talking about creating stories that are that are set in a queer context where they're about queer people. And it sort of doesn't matter what the, the rest of the world looks like. If the rest of the world is LGBT, that sort of thing. But I think, you know, it's it's about in your room, in as much of the production as possible, creating that queer context, if that's what's important for the story and sharing that world with people. And obviously, we all understand how um, incredibly powerful it is as a as a viewer as a young viewer as an adult viewer to see that world on screen to 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 be shown that there is a world where you can exist as a queer person in a queer context is like for me that's that's it you know th those are my favorite pieces of media are the ones that just say you can have a whole world to yourself you know it exists come come find it come be a part of it i think something that i've found that is so uh kind of heartbreaking and difficult about my job is that i mean i love what i do because it also it, you know it creates a lot of jobs for writers and a lot of opportunities and so active inclusive hiring is something that i've you know very much committed myself to um but what's really heartbreaking is because that takes more work you know because that means there might be a couple awkward conversations because that means essentially that when you say I'd like to hire a queer writer, you know, you're coming face to face with people's homophobia, you're coming face to face with people saying, well, why aren't we just hiring the best person for the job? Why are we doing that? You know, like the anger and the frustration that comes at you is very upsetting. You know, it's really, it's really bizarre because you're like, you know, like other people have said so eloquently, you know, the norm, you know, like is not something we question. You know, if I bring a straight white guy in to hire, no one wonders whether or not that's the right person for the job. But to consistently advocate and to mentor other queer artists, it's it's hard, but we have to do it or those numbers will not change. Like, and we have to do it on, you know, shows and, you know, obviously, you know, our work kind of skews toward telling queer stories either for queer audiences or for straight audiences. But like, you know, I think that one thing, one trap that the hiring falls into is like, well, this isn't a queer story. Why are we hiring a queer writer? You know, like it starts to become this like, well, the only thing you can talk about is being queer. The only, the only value you would add to the room is the LGBTQ experience and, you know, so on and so forth. And I think that, you know, people have to kind of, the people that are hiring and who are making those decisions need to get it out of their head that this is like just because this takes some extra steps and some extra work does not mean that it's like somehow i think i think brandon said this like the, the loss of power is something that you just feel like so intensely like even just over phone calls you can feel it like it just people get scared it's it's challenging to say you know this is the type of person i'd like to hire these are the type of people i the type of writers i'd like to look at you know it's very um even i get uncomfortable when i say it you know when i say i'd like to do that you know like it, it just suddenly i'm like am i saying the right thing am i using the right terminology like but my discomfort you know for what 15 seconds you know could change somebody's life you know it could bring those numbers up like it could change the type of stories that are being told so it's like I hate that it's on us, you know, it really should be on other people, like, other people to change, but you know, it, it is, it is a part of our job and it's part of my job that I take very seriously. I think what you're, what Leslie is speaking to is, is interesting because it, it speaks to, there's a lot to unpack there. A is that it speaks to the system, that the system operates in a way where we have to go into spaces already feeling you know, triggered on the defense, you know, prepared to fight. 
um, to say, I wanna see more representation in my room. Um, but I also think it speaks to that burden of representation that we, we talked about earlier, which is that there's typically only enough space for one. And so when that happens, you know, it's like, it, it's just, there's the responsibility, all the onus on representation then falls on that one person, which really, you know, it isn't fair. And I think to tether what Leslie was saying to something that, again, that Trace said earlier, which I think was like, for me, just like a very, you know, obviously <laughs> um, astute observation is like, it goes back to that idea of like being in the car and have holding the wheel, right? And driving, like steering, steering the car in whatever direction it needs to go in. And I think that that's that, again, it's that responsibility that we often don't talk about, right? It's like, have we been equipped with the tools to do that? And then are we being set up for success when we're being handed the keys to the car? And like those other conversations that we're not, we're not steeped in them, you know, like we're not actually fully engaged in that at all. Um, and so I think that that's, that's one of those gaps when we're talking about um, representation. I just want to echo that I think that mentorship is like everything and it, it doesn't exist, you know, mentorship and, and room to fail. Like, it's like you, I've, as somebody who's in a writer's room, you come in, you're the only one. And then if you don't do well, like there's no one like looking out for you necessarily. And if you don't do well, then you represent that, oh, we shouldn't have made that choice. And that is just an unfair pressure on anybody on any young artist, right? Like you should be given, I feel like these shows, all of our shows should have built in systems to mentor, especially if it's a woman in the room, if it's a queer person in the room, anyone from a marginalized group coming into these predominantly straight white spaces should be given support to know that like it's a safe space to learn and do and to, I wish that the powers that be would have an awareness that it's not just the art that we have to deal with, it's the emotional aspect of this, right? There's a whole emotional side of this that a lot of our bosses are not uh, privy to, aware of, or interested in. And that's a shift that needs to happen is that like, we can't just approach this as a business. If we're really trying to, to fuck this system up, we do have to acknowledge there's a lot of emotional baggage that has to be undone from the years of erasure, you know, from the years of black shows with all white rooms, from the years of queer characters being written by straight people and having homophobic and transphobic jokes. Like that wears on us as artists. And, and so there's a little more investment that needs to happen in the, in the change. I also just think to Brandon's point about mentorship, I, you know, one of the things that, you know, and I'm curious um, how the other creators and showrunners feel about this, but what is hard is that in television experiences is so valued, or at least, you know, people think like, oh, this experienced person like will be great for this show and should come in. And because of our like messed up world, those experienced people are predominantly white, cis, and heter heterosexual. So the, what we're finding is this like moment where we, it's like you have to um, elevate and bring in newer, younger voices, as Brendan so eloquently put, like give them the room to fail, but also like figure out how to reverse this system or how to change this system so all of these people can come kind of to the top and be those experienced people that you can go to and say, yes, this is, you know, uh, this is the person that, that has to be in my room. But I think to connect what you just said, Daniel, to what Brandon was saying earlier is like, it's what is the experience that we're putting value on? Because, you know, I think again, like what, what I'm hearing from you though, is like that experience, which I think is it's endemic to the, to the, the system that is Hollywood is um, having room experience, which I'm not gonna knock that that's not important. But I think at least what I heard what Brandon was saying is like, there's like our own lived experience that informs what's happening in the story, what's happening on the page. And it feels like in Hollywood, that's not the thing that we're putting a lot of value into. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I think um, for me, <clears throat> what I struggle with is um, the, a lot of respectability politics and um, 
a lot of academic privilege in Hollywood. Um, I think specifically for trans folk, a lot of us haven't had the opportunity to even graduate high school or go to college. I mean, me, myself, I survived the streets. That is experience. It may not be, it may not make sense to the powers that be. It may not make sense to the average writer's room, but there is important stories that I have lived and that my sisters have lived that we can bring to the table that somebody cannot write unless they've, unless they've been there. And I think that's something that I struggle with. Um, I have a show in development right now and I, I try to always um, make my points as best as I can and try to do all this like, translating for these people like trying to get them to understand like what it what it really gives what it what it was like what why it's important and i think the labor of that in itself can be really exhausting when you're the only one there you're the only trans person in the room or even amongst queer spaces queer academics they don't understand what a certain path was like and i think that we put a lot of weight in um, academics and, and protocol and, and you know, um, how things have been done and not as much weight in lived experience or that raw, real piece that somebody can't really write unless they've known it. And um, I think we have to find a, a way to start putting value in people's experiences that aren't just familiar to whatever you know, Hollywood is comfortable with whether, you know, or if it's not delivered in the way that Hollywood is comfortable with. I think there's, I think there's beauty and there's value in stuff that is not, that is not traditional or delivered in a traditional way. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Th thank you everyone for sharing your input on that and kind of um, Trace to bounce off of what you were saying. Th these conversations need to still be happening even in queer spaces, even in queer writers' rooms. Um, I, I imagine, at least in, in my experience as, as a witness to it, there are still things intersectionally that are kind of siloed in the LGBTQ community, whether it be the token trans person in the community or the, the voice, the, the non-white voice. The, I mean, the list goes on, but I'm curious, Trace, for your perspective on that. And, even in queer run spaces, where is there room for improvement? Do you see these conversations happening to uphold trans brothers, brothers and sisters in these conversations? Um, what, what's been your experience with that? What I see most of the time is tokenization. I see one person will get through and they'll get through the pearly gates and they'll have to just be it for the whole community. And unfortunately, you know, our stories are not all the same. We don't all come from the same struggle or background or journey. And I think that when you only let one through, it does a disservice to us. And um, it's really exhausting. It's exhausting um, having been in the game now for 14 years that I'm still out here living guest star to guest star, gig to gig, wanting to find that job that's gonna make it all okay. That's gonna make it all worth it. Like, oh my God, I've been out here this long and I can finally um, land that series reg and maybe I'm not the only one. Like maybe there's room for more of us and, and we're not, we don't have this crabs in a barrel mentality or we're putting each other down and stepping on the next girl or whatever the case may be. And there can be room for everybody. And I think that when you don't allow space for all of us to get through, it just creates more negativity. Yeah, and I, I mean, I think that can be kind of a takeaway for this whole conversation that there is the space for everyone to get through. And um, it's about time that that's seen in film, television, theater and ac across entertainment. Absolutely. Um, just to wrap things up here, um, thank you everyone for sharing the last hour with us. This has been so, so awesome for me and for everyone in the audience. I see some great comments here. Um, considering backstage is kind of for the working actors, for the working creators of the world earlier in their careers than, than you may be. Um, I'm curious if we could just go around and offer the one piece of advice that you wish you had in your back pocket when you were getting started in this industry. Um, we can go uh, alphabetically, so we'll start with the Barneses and then uh, kind of go from there. 
Can I start? Um, I think, I mean, this is, this is a pretty specific one from just like a writing perspective. I think the best advice I've ever gotten about writing was probably just that your first draft only needs to exist. It doesn't need to make sense to anyone but you. It doesn't need to be perfect or polished. Its only job is to exist and then you can move from there and you can't edit a blank page. So just start with something and then continue from there. Um, I guess my advice would be have a really smart, talented, queer daughter and ride her coattails. <laughs> um, but separate from that, I think echoing Zelda, you know, uh, the, I think the, the, the thing that I wish that I had understood from the get-go was that you just, you just keep writing. You just, you just keep doing it. Um, and that's the only way to kind of power through, um, you know, rejection and failure, um, which, you know, I've experienced over and over, you just kind of keep, keep doing it. Um, and I think, you know, uh, to, to people who are actors, figuring out um, ways to continue to create um, separate from needing to walk into a room and have somebody say, yes, you can play this role um, is like a saving grace. Absolutely. Steven, your turn. Um, the first thing I thought about is Malcolm Gladwell and what he talks about, you know, you have to have your 10,000 hours. So I mean, I think that my, the advice that I wish I was given when I moved to LA nine years ago to, to really fully pursue this very seriously, um, was just to be patient, be patient with myself, um, and to continue to work on my craft. Because I think I understand the, and I think, you know, like I, I keep echoing all the things Trey said, she keeps saying really great things. Um, but what she just talked about, you know, like being in this industry for 14 years and working hard, it's like that, you know, there's a lot of, um, it's a long road, you know, and it takes a really long time to get to a place of being seen and to get to a place of success. And I often see people, they move here and immediately expect all the doors to open up. And it's like, it doesn't, it, that's just not realistic. Like it really, it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort and a lot of work. And you have a lot of talented people who are still waiting for that moment. And so to me, it's like, just keep working on your craft because if you keep working on your craft, whether you're an actor, a writer, a director, a producer, like make it so that you are undeniable because the reality is like, especially for us as LGBTQ plus people, that's what we have to be. We have to be 10 times better than our straight cis counterparts. So keep working. And Adam, you would be next. Um, I, first of all, just all of this advice is like, I want it all carved above my door. Um, uh, I, I think on the same track, I think um, my advice is just make the thing. Um, and like what Zelda said, make the thing, make the thing better. The next thing you make is going to be even better. And don't, if, if you can, don't wait for someone to tell you that you can do it. We live in an incredible time where you can make the story that you want to make and get it out to people in a lot of different ways. Um, so my advice is just make, make the thing however, however you can. Yeah, and you've certainly been witness to that firsthand, to say the least. Um, Brandon, we'll go to you, and then Leslie, and then Trace, and then we'll wrap it up. My godmother said to me a few months ago, when you find yourself comparing, wake up. I think it's really easy to fall into a trap of comparison and to lose time because you're comparing, I should be there, what are they doing? I want to do what they're doing. That That's a waste of time. The only person you got to worry about is yourself. And to that end, your community is the most important part. So cultivate a group of artists because the Hollywood shit is cute and everybody's whatever, but your people, the people who came up with you, who have your back, who are going to pick up the phone when you had a hard day at work, when you're feeling that imposter syndrome, who are going to champion you when you book that gig, those are the people to keep close to you. The Hollywood shit is cute and pearly, but it's your people. Build your community. There, you are nothing, nothing without your community and your collaborators, period. Uh, yeah, I just also want to reiterate, like, thank you so much, everyone, for holding this space. I'm so emotional. I don't know why. Um, <laughs> uh, I just am so affected by 
all of us being able to say what we really are feeling. I'm so sorry. I don't know what's going on. Um, it's, I don't know, Mer Mercury's in retrograde. Uh, I just want to, jumping off what Brandon said, um, you know, a, a version of, I would kind of say a version of, of, of what Brandon just said in, in sense of, if you're an artist, you do need a safe, a sense of safety to create. You need a safe space to create. Hollywood is not a safe space. And that's, that's not to say, you know, it's like the Olympics are not a safe space. Like, it's just, not, it's not negative or positive. It just, you know, it just is. And, and I think that, you know, a sense of community, whatever you need to do, your heart is what creates you know, your inner child is what creates, your higher power is what creates, whatever you want to call it, like your muse is what creates, and you must protect that at all costs. The further you get away from that, the harder it will be to continue working. And, and that's not, that's just been my experience. That's not just me being, you know, uh, like Brandon said, cute, you know, <laughs> like it just, my experience has been that unless you can lean into that authenticity, unless you can speak from your truth, no amount of, you know, maneuvering and managing and controlling and middle management and trying to assimilate and trying to make people happy and trying to play the game is going to work. So, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing and absolutely no need to apologize. This has been so great just to share this space with all of you. Um, Trace, let's, let's wrap it up with you. Yeah, that was really beautiful, Leslie. Um, just kind of in that same vein, uh, if I could tell myself one piece of advice early on, I would say, because I think for so many years as an actor, you spend you spend so much time and effort trying to fit a part, trying to fit this, trying to be this or that, or fit in people's boxes. And, um, and part of that is necessary for the journey or to land your first gig or get your first credits or whatever the case may be, you gotta play the game. But at some point I realized I'm not for everybody. I'm not, I, I've had a very unique path in life and understanding that, that your power, your superpower is in your uniqueness. And that once you understand that and own it and claim it, you can start to attract other creators to you. You can other, other like-minded people. When you live in your truth unapologetically, for me, I wish I would have learned that earlier. I wish I would have known that about myself earlier because that is priceless. Priceless is the word, absolutely. Um, well, I, I, uh, I wish we didn't have to, to say goodbye. This has been such a magical hour with all of you um, and everyone in the audience. Thank you for tuning in. Um, happy Pride to you all. Congratulations on all the work that you've been doing. Um, all the work that's to come and still to be done. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll just leave it there. Thank you so much for sharing your time and your space and energy with us today. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks Thank so much, everybody. Us. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank, thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.